Welcome to Exagility. I'm your host, John Coleman. Jim Benson, welcome to the Exagility podcast. How are you doing today? I'm doing really well. Thank you. Which part of the world are you in today, Jim? I am in Seattle, which I have been in longer than I have been in since I moved here 30 years ago because COVID has made me very familiar with my studio. (laughs) (laughs) New keyboard, four new basses, two new guitars, one new sound processor, four new speakers. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> 13 years of constant travel meant no music so i have tried to make the most of these two years getting, oh, getting back cool. to my roots so that's really good news jim you're famous for a couple of things that probably annoys you that you're famous for a couple of things there's loads of other things that you do i'm sure but what you're probably best known for so far would be personal kanban lean coffee and your mm-hmm. approach to value stream mm-hmm. mapping for knowledge work before we even get into all of that, Jim, I'm, I'm curious how the story started. Where did this journey to personal Kanban even start for you? It's funny because at the, at the beginning of the new book, what I say is that like most process geeks, I started off at Toyota and then I have that crossed out and I say as an angry punk rocker in the middle of Nebraska. My career in all of this literally started in high school as an angry punk rocker. And as you might guess, in the middle of Nebraska, we were a small group, which meant that we had to learn how to play our instruments, make albums, build supply chains, sell records, get people to come to concerts, find places to host us at all. So we had to learn business at 14 and 15 years old. And by the time we all went off to college, we had this kind of weird global following. And this was in the 80s. This is always a joke in the US, but we played well in France, a lot of fans in France. So I went from there to try and become an angry punk rocker, figured out after a year or so of trying to do that, that that wasn't a good long-term business strategy for me. And then went to university, studied psychology, and then ultimately got degrees in urban planning went off and became an urban planner and civil engineer, built freeways, subways, things with multi-billion dollar price tags and teams of thousands of people. And through all of that, the thing was like the group. When you're a consulting engineer, I was at Parsons Brinkerhoff and David Evans and Associates and a bunch of other companies, you never went for a project alone. So you always had to build a team, then go get the work and then do the work as a team and do it well, which meant you had to communicate and collaborate effectively. And when William Rowden, my old business partner, started our software company, it was to build software for government to make government more collaborative. And we did a really wonderful job with that. And in the middle of that, we had this partnership with David Anderson, and he and I would get together just over here at Milady's Pub every week and figure out like, what, how do we get your agile management book to actually work. And one night we ended up drawing out what became like the first proto Kanban on a napkin at Milady's. And Dave went off and did his version at Microsoft. So it's kind of a more corporate version. And then I went off yeah. and did yeah. personal Kanban at my company. And then we started Modus Cooperandi together with Corey Lattice and did that for a while. Then Dave went off on, on his own. And since then, I've been working with Tony and Di Maria. We wrote the personal Kanban book. So just to let you know how people age, I'm sorry that you won't be able to see this on the recording, but you'll be able to see this if you watch the YouTube <laughs> video, is here's a picture of me when I was in leadership of the Names Project AIDS Memorial Quilt, which was the world's largest collaboration, the world's largest public art project, and the world's largest memorial in history. I was young then. I did that for 10 years. So everything for me has always been about cooperating, collaborating, people getting together and doing good work. So I I remember I was on a train journey last week and I was passing a huge construction project for HS2 in in England, a a fast train line between Mm -hmm. London and Birmingham. And it's an absolutely massive project. And I was thinking, how do these people manage that work? And I believe you were involved in construction for a while. You mentioned subways and even skyscrapers, I Mm -hmm. believe. What was it like being involved in those kind of projects with so many dependencies and so many things that can go wrong? And what was your coping strategy in dealing with those kind of things? The the nice thing is that bad behavior scale. So if you've been on a small team, 
and there's been some bad behavior, you've had a bad system and it's made people behave in bad ways, that scales way out to great big projects. But the good news also is that good behavior also can scale if you build a coherent system where people know what's going on. When I was building the light rail system for Seattle or the bus tunnel here in Seattle or light rail in Tel Aviv or wherever the projects were, the project was always and only as successful as the amount of professionalism and collaboration that the project allowed. And at the last company I was uh, part of for doing that type of work, David Evans and Associates, we had a saying that they found outstanding professionals and gave them the tools that they needed to do an outstanding job. And <laughs> honest to God, I would not be where I am today. I wouldn't have written the books. I wouldn't have done anything if I hadn't been part of that atmosphere because they meant it. They built a real culture that really supported the people who worked there. And that support showed through in their work, like the work product in their work, like their working environment. And so recently as part of modus cooperandi, I'm a company now, I did some consulting at Turner construction in New York for about five years, building major projects like billion dollar buildings in New York. And taking not only what I'd learned back at David Evans and Associates and on those projects, but also Kanban and uh, Obeyas or War Rooms or you know, different ways to visualize work to get teams together. And they blessed me with one of the best cultures I've ever seen. The Turner Construction literally has one of the best corporate cultures I've seen anywhere on earth. Something that's of interest to me is the leadership behaviors. Mm -hmm. Uh, we might circle back to that later on. Um, that would be good because uh, I have a lot of good leadership stories. And I'm guessing that a lot of that's probably featuring in your book as well. Your, your book is going to be called a collaboration equation. Is that right? Yes, that is right. Um, and that's supposed to come nice out time. in July. God of the books willing. <laughs> Are you going to do an audio book uh, version of that as well, Jim? I will. Thinking yes. about yeah, good. Yeah, because yeah. a lot of people like myself, we've got backlogs of books and finding those hours to read. And I chew through them more easily when I'm getting the tube here in London mm -hmm. or uh, getting a train or a plane or something. And uh, it'd be nice as well if you could do the narration yourself, but uh, otherwise maybe just get a really good narrator, I guess. No, I, yeah. I will do it myself because one of the reasons why there isn't a personal Kanban audio book is we tried to find an, a narrator for it and they all sounded yeah. like this. <laughs> <laughs> and I was just like, I can't take it. I, I no, no audiobook until I can do it myself. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. I think they so you, get the, like, you just want to get the sense of the emotion from the person as well when they're speaking, what's really important in the sentence. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I and Tony Ann and I are super passionate about this stuff. And so this is another reason why it was hard to find someone else to read something that was as personal to us as that book. Yeah. So you wrote Personal Kanban with uh, Torian to Maria Barry, yeah. and it's been up for a while. Is it 10 years now? It is 12. 12 years. Soiks. Okay. <laughs> yeah, um, it's, it's been yeah. a while. So yeah. 2010 was when it was done. The number on the book is 2011. It's like a car that way. Ah, uh, okay. Okay. Personal Kanban, can you tell us a little bit about it for, the, for those who are curious? Uh... Yeah, the personal in Personal Kanban is meant to note objects that are important to people. <laughs> so Kanban as a tool in Lean or at Toyota is objects moving through a workflow that are generally yeah. of importance to finishing the product. But we were interested in how do human beings and their work relate? And how can we make sure that the system is constantly optimizing for the best performance of the team? And that doesn't mean the most productivity. It means how do you keep the machinery of the team healthy? So how does the system note, okay, we've got a bunch of tasks here that are for just getting this project done. And then we have other tasks to keep our culture maintained other tasks that are improvement tasks. And maybe every so often we have a certain number of tasks where it's take half a day off, relax, read a book, talk to somebody, go have coffee. And so we try and have those human elements in there as well. The format is not dissimilar from any other knowledge work Kanban. You have a value stream, you have objects flowing from left to right through the value stream. We have a few less rules and encourage people to come up with their own rules. But 
one of the things that we do say is that if you have if you're operating a team and you're not using some type of a visual system to track your workflow and its impact on the people, then you're not managing your project. You're not professional at all. Yeah. That's our yeah. only categorical statement that we will offer. You need to brush your teeth twice a day. You need to visualize your work. And I noticed you had two, uh, there was the two practices. I'm not sure what word you use, uh, visualizing the work and limiting work in progress. You kept it as that. And I loved the way you explained it in one of your videos, focus and finish, focus and finish. There's a nice yes. twist to that. Another video I saw where you were talking about micromanagers, really, really nice, where you were even playing out the part of the person who's receiving the attention of the micromanager and the micromanager, uh, you're very good at acting. Books. It just keeps giving them books, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And you're explaining that personal Kanban is essentially a coping strategy for dealing with that because essentially you're visualizing what you have. Uh, all the information is there. And uh, if anything needs to be flagged, it can be flagged. It can actually support uh, a kind of a one-to-one -one meeting as well on a week-to-week -week basis. You've got more mm -hmm. stuff to talk about or less stuff to talk about because we're actually visualizing what's going on. I, I love the expression you used was that micromanagement is an outgrowth of fear that work won't get done. Mm -hmm. And that uh, personal Kanban is a way of kind of coping with that. So yeah, in knowledge work, we can't see what people are doing in their heads. <laughs> so we're worried <laughs> constantly that stuff isn't getting done. And yeah. generally in a situation like that, if something's completed successfully, no one will talk about it at all. So the only conversations that people end up having are when things fail. And then people feel like everything is failing because those are the only conversations you're having. Psychologists call it the availability heuristic is the things that we are confronted with the most are the things that we define as our overall universe. So what we want to do is be able to visualize all of the work that's happening so that we can see what's completed and understand, mm -hmm. yes, there is a positive ratio between successful completion and these things that don't work the way we expect them to. And then that yeah. helps us see those things that don't work the way they expected them to as, oh, that didn't go the way I thought and not as a failure or something to blame somebody for, but just mm. that some work doesn't go the way that you plan. And if it did, if all work went exactly the way it planned, we would all be making about $2 an hour because our work would have no value. It could all be automated. Mm. <laughs> yeah. The yeah. reason yeah. that we get paid money is because some things don't go the way we plan them. <laughs> yeah, that's a good way of looking at it, actually. I, I do a lot of Kanban work myself, Jim, and one of my clients recently, I heard, I heard this expression, big brother, that at, say, like CXO, say, minus two, minus three, some people in certain roles were thinking, well, uh, Big Brother's watching now. Not only did they have Kanban for people in teams, uh, you, you can have your own mm -hmm. personal Kanban record, they had it for teams, and then you had a value stream level. Uh, Klaus talks about flight levels, for example, and then another mm -hmm. level, strategic level. And so I thought it was an interesting comment because I, I was struggling to get some people to even just update their Kanban board once per week, not even once per mm -hmm. day, once per week. And they were even ducking that one. And uh, I'm curious, have you come across that yourself where people have this sense, you know, I've got Big Brother watching me now and uh, it's just maybe too much visibility? One of the things that we've created is what we call the system of humane management. Mm -hmm. And when we go in and work with teams, if we're going through a value stream mapping exercise or some other exercise, we will watch teams interact with each other. And by virtue of the VSM or other things, how they react with the rest of the company. And mo most teams aren't teams. Most teams are silos. Yeah. And that's where like we get all these conversations about dependencies. There are zero dependencies in software development <laughs> and there are zero dependencies in work. What there are is work that doesn't fit your existing silo structure. That's, that's it. That's a nice way of looking at it. Yeah. Yeah. You haven't brought the appropriate people together to get the work done. Therefore, you've bifurcated, trifurcated, quadfurcated, if that's even a word. But yeah. you split up the work that was a cohesive unit between a bunch of different teams. And now those teams yeah. are fighting because there's no clear definition of who's supposed to do what in that work. Yeah. yeah and yeah. even worse is one team's probably in charge of it. And the other teams don't know it's there until it's too late. So it's like bumper cars at that point. So in the system of humane management, we're watching all the time for how people are talking about other people 
when they're talking about whether or not they have the information that they need to get their work done. Mm -hmm. So uh, we say that individuals work in teams to provide value or to create value. Agile mm -hmm. tends to look at teams and nothing else. Lean tends yeah. to look at quality and nothing else. And no one is looking at individual professionals. <laughs> so we try and build systems that say, all right, are the individuals healthy so that they can work in a team? Is the team healthy so that it can create the value? And that in order to have a healthy team, that team has to know what its relationships are with leadership, with other teams, with the customer, et cetera. Yeah. That reminds me of a conversation I had with Steve Tendon. He's, he's involved with team flow, a combination of theory, constraints, and Kanban, mm -hmm. if you like. But he talked about full kitting and he talked about it as a way of lining up our ducks before we start the work. And as Troy McGuinness would say, a, a blocker is a dependency probably that hasn't been communicated and getting all that lined up. And let's say I want Jim to do some work or maybe uh, Vanessa or Adam, I want them to do some work or whatever. Have you even told them? Have they even acknowledged coming back as well? But also double checking as well with the customer. You asked for that stuff three months ago. Like, what problem are you trying to solve here? What are you really mm -hmm. trying to do? And those conversations uh, don't happen as often as I'd like to see them as well. This is what's fascinating to me about the last 14 months is weirdly enough, when we took these teams, especially in agile, where we'd put them in one place and we told them, you are special little teams, everyone should answer to you, you're all self-organizing. And then the moment that they stopped sitting next to each other, all of a sudden they noticed that they didn't know what was going on. And yeah. that was beautiful. So what, what it used to be was we do a value stream mapping exercise with the software team and the software team would be like, look, or the software developers would be like, look, just make sure that the work is fully composed before I get it so that I can do the work. Yeah. Now the software developers are saying, can we be involved in the planning of the work so that we know what's coming and why we're doing it? Yeah, and they didn't absolutely. ask That's that before. And yeah. It's Christmas for me. When I noticed the trend, I was like, I wouldn't let myself believe it. But now we've gone through maybe, I would say maybe a good 16 or 17 value stream mapping exercises that we've done over the last several months. And yeah. all the teams, regardless of vertical even, are asking to be part of the creation of their own work. And we warn them, we're like, well, this means you're going to actually have to go to a planning meeting. Are you going to have to talk about the work? You might have to talk to a customer and they're like, great. And I was like, you didn't say that before. So yeah. business seems to be from top down or bottom up, business seems to be evolving into a more collaborative model. And I think part of it is actually because we've all had to try and figure out what was going home with absolutely no cues at all. I've even seen situations where not only were the ducks not being lined up, but when the work was being sent off to some other silo to do some step or whatever, the people over there had completely different priorities. And not only were they not 100%. even acknowledging, they weren't pulling, they weren't selecting, they weren't even communicating in terms of when this will happen to the extent that some items could have 200 days on them, you know, kind of mm -hmm. thing. And yeah, it was really interesting. And I'm seeing the same thing as well. I'm seeing people starting to look upstream what's coming next. And the kind of conversations that I'm hearing now are much healthier, kind of like when they're talking about what stuff can we do in 2022, because it's the time of the recording, 2022. Mm -hmm. What did you get done last year? What did you get done this time last year? You don't have a smooth flow the whole year. You got periodic seasonal things going on. Mm -hmm. What was March, April for you like last year? And maybe you shouldn't plan... The same as you did last year, because there's going to be some surprises. And are you sure you can start all that stuff in May? These kind of conversations, I'm, I'm starting to see those now. So it's really encouraging. So four or five years ago, we got a call. And there was a man who owned a set of manufacturing plants across the Midwestern U.S. Yeah. Say I own, I own all these manufacturing plants. And this is, yeah, so I've owned, owned them since the 60s. He's like, mm -hmm. obviously, I'm getting kind of old, and I'm going to turn the company over to my kids. We have six plants and blah, 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 blah. He said, he said I've, I've seen people grow up in our organization. I've seen them have kids. I've seen the kids go to college, and I felt really good. And I realized over the last couple of months that the way we manage our company is hurting people. 
Oh. And we'd like you to come in and help us not hurt people, but still be an effective organization. And so when awesome. I got that call and was working at, at Turner, which is, as I've said, is a company that I never would have expected had a healthy culture. So you, you use the word healthy and I love the word healthy, a healthy team. I'll take a healthy team over a mature team any day because a yeah, mature team is trying to tick other people's boxes. A healthy team works yeah. well together. But like I said, with that guy, it was, that was the CEO coming and saying, we would like a healthier way of operating. I'd love to talk more about that because, and I'm wondering if that's coming up in your book as well, the collaboration equation, mm -hmm. like maybe you can go back as well to Turner's as well, in terms of what you observed, what kind of behaviors you observed, because I'm really curious about this whole area, because I think there's loads of solutions out there for what teams do, and there's even the solutions out there for how teams can work together and you've been working for a while and how people mm -hmm. can be more effective and so on. But I don't know, there seems to have been a bit of a, there's a lot of kind of soft stuff for the leadership stuff. Like mm -hmm. you can try all these little things, but nothing really tangible. And I'm curious what you've been cooking up in that area. And maybe we can share some stories together okay. about that. Yeah. So many directions to go with that. Several years ago, I stopped taking clients in Silicon Valley because they were all not serious about business. They were all very serious about figuring out ways to get people to come to their products so that they could sell it to Google or Facebook. <laughs> uh, but they weren't very serious about actually building quality product. And so when I got to Turner, I had become frustrated and jaded. And in a 116 year old at that time, uh, construction company, I really didn't expect to find anything other than bureaucracy and frustration. So the CEO of Turner Construction is a guy named Peter Davern. The company itself operates without explicitly telling anybody to do with a lot of professionalism. So the people are there to safely build a giant building in the shortest amount of time possible so that people can get in and start using this massive investment. And if they're late on a deadline, it costs people millions of dollars a month. Okay. So if I'm going to move my offices from one building into the building you're building and my lease is going to end on August 31st, I want to make sure that on August 1st, I'm starting to move into the new space. And if I can't, okay. it's going to cost me millions of dollars. So the repercussions there are real. So in software, we like to say that we don't have a lot of deadlines. Deadlines are sometimes quite real. And so they had to be very serious about these things. So Peter Davern at one point said, look, I want all job sites to be lean. He didn't particularly know what he meant by that, but he knew that he wanted it. And he said, I want all of them to have the right environment, which is essentially falling back to the David Evans line that I said earlier, which is we hire outstanding professionals and give them the tools they need to do an outstanding job. So yeah. the Turner people, had to figure out how to take these directives from Peter, whom they respect like you wouldn't believe. I've never been in a company where people respect their CEO as much as they respect Peter. And so they're like, okay, the right environment sounds like a joke. We're a bunch of super not fuzzy thinkers. <laughs> how do we make this thing work? At the beginning of every project now, they do a right environment exercise. They take the professionals who are going to work on that and they say, what do you need to be successful in this project? And that varies from project to project. Yeah. It's not like the Turner way where it says, here's what you get to be good professionals. It's what do you as a group need to build this housing project here, or this hospital here, or this sports stadium here, you're going to need different things because the product is different, the people are different, et cetera. On the Coney Island Hospital project, one of the things they wanted was a dog. They got a dog. <laughs> <It's not happy. laughs> yeah, they have, they have the project dog. Now, how does this become tangible? Because that just all sounds really weird. <laughs> so the ways that this becomes tangible is first, leadership always has to give a damn. You can't just yeah. give people orders and walk away. You have to show that you really give a damn. And yeah. so Agile does like the servant leadership thing, which is basically the abdication of responsibility 
hey guys, what do you want to do? <laughs> I don't know. What do you want to do? I don't know. What do you want to do? Oh God, six months have gone by and nothing's happened. I wonder how that happened. So Pierre Davin's, no, damn it. We're going to have these things. Now get your butts out there and self-organize. And so they went out and got their butts out there, but then Peter would show up because he gave a damn and he'd say, what are you doing? <laughs> and if they couldn't show him something, then it gave him an infinite palette to criticize. Yeah. It's like sitting down with Gordon Ramsay and telling him what you think you're going to cook. <laughs> 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 he will tell you everything that could possibly be wrong with what you're going to cook, even though you haven't cooked it. So they had to come up with, or we had to come up with visualizations, which we put in things called obeyas, and that would include a Kanban, but there'd be a whole bunch of different ones. Yeah. Yeah. And each of those things tells people what the state of something is, what triggers yeah. for action there are, what the narrative is, basically what the plan is to get there, what the direction is, which is what decisions have we made? How have we deviated from our original plan? What the culture is, what the professionalism is, and what the identity of the team is. And those seven things should be in almost every visualization that you have on the wall. And then what happens is when somebody like Peter Davern comes in and they look at your visualizations, the visualization tells them the story, they interpret it and to a person, they will look at it and they won't ask questions. They'll start telling your story to you. And so what happens then is that somebody in leadership can actually give some direction. And now there is a format for quote unquote rank and file or everyone else to start building that thing in a safe and sane manner. So mm -hmm. Kevin Chase, who was one of the guys there, he said, this allows me to work with confidence, which literally was the most powerful statement I've heard anybody make in my entire career of doing this stuff. End of rant. <laughs> so I'm just wondering though, because a lot of the time with leaders, one of the biggest concerns is when will it be done? And yes. a lot of the time we don't really know. We can use probabilistic forecasting and all that. If it's complicated, it'll probably work. But if it's complex, it's a bit smoke and mirrors, but you can probably still say, I'll give you a better forecast next week. It's better than giving them nothing because it's They'll just make up a deadline. But in your situation, that was real, right? You had real deadlines. Those were real so, deadlines. And in real software life, there are real deadlines too. We're just craftspeople yeah. and not professionals. And craftspeople don't have to make deadlines. They sit in their wood shop and bang on things. <laughs> professionals <laughs> actually do figure out how to make deadlines. So with every software yeah. development team, there is a mixture because you went down the Kinevin route. There's a yeah. mixture of clear, complicated, complex and, and uh, chaotic work. Yeah. And there always yeah. will be. So the question is, do you have standard practices? Do you have standard work to deal with things that are clear, complicated, complex, and so forth? And so generally, for almost every software development team I've had, the work is somebody writes a very concrete demand into a very vague user story. <laughs> the very vague user story becomes something that might or might not resemble the original demand. Yeah. And they do the same process, whether it's clear, complicated, complex, or chaotic. One That's person exactly takes it. the work yeah. and just bangs on it until they think that it's done. And the more complex it is, the more crappy their work is going to be. And if they don't yeah. finish, they feel like they failed. So we try and give software development teams actually that Kinevin framework in the backlog of their Kanban. Yes, yeah, I and saw you, that in one of your videos. Yeah, yeah. it was really nice. So when something comes up and it's going to be complex, the complex work has to be done by more than one person. That complex work is going to have to include an A3. That complex work is going to require a research phase before you actually start doing the coding. That the coding is going to start with a spike. <laughs> so we manufacture our own freakouts by just handling our work so unbelievably unprofessionally in software development. So if we did those things regularly, then we can be honest about where the complexity lies and say, this stuff here, we're going to get done. These things here are going to be weird. And 
that's true for any type of project. Our problem yeah. is that we just haven't professionally managed software development. That rings the bell, a leader I work with, what she's done is exactly what you mentioned. This type of work, someone can just work it on their own. They just crack on with it. They don't need Scrum. They just go off and do it. Mm -hmm. uh, this thing over here involves a bit of a handover. Maybe we need a few people working together on a Kanban board and just keep an eye on it, make sure it doesn't get forgotten. Mm -hmm. And then the complex work, what, what do we need to work on together today? How can we help each other out? And instead of boring each other with the mundane details of everything we did yesterday and what we're doing today and stuff like that. <laughs> so that okay, so you have to do a research, we have to do an H3, we have to do a spike. We still don't know when it'll be done. We still have a deadline in front of us. How have you helped leaders deal with that? So right now what they're doing, or what anybody's doing, is we're managing by the method of wishful thinking. And we're saying, this is when this needs to be done. Everybody go off and do it in your own self-organized way. Imagine for a moment that you're curling and then you self-organize your curling. So it's okay, you guys take the brooms and when you feel like it, just kind of sweet. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes people actually need direction. The reason that we chafe in it in Agile is because the direction usually comes from a person. But as we just talked yeah. about now, the teams are actually talking about real self-organization, which is, do we all understand the work that's on our plate intimately? Yeah. Yeah. And then are we reacting to that work in the best way possible? Yeah. And we're working with a company in Germany right now, and they have been amazing over the last few months at saying, this work requires people from three or four teams. Let's grab them. And for three days, they will become that mini team, that tiger team, as they call it. They get the work yeah. done and it ends. Yeah. yeah. And no one cries. It's a truly professional environment where people really self-organize, not just screw around in a team. Yeah, not that yeah, I have I any strong it. feelings about this or anything. Oh, no, I'm not getting that at all. <laughs> But there's one word that you mentioned quite a lot, which is obey a room, right? And yep. a lot of people call them war rooms. And I personally like that you've gone back to the word obey, but can you tell us a little bit about that? Why is it that you chose to go with obey over a war room? Just curious. Well, about that. a few reasons. One is that it, it is an obey. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so, so that would be my pedantic reason. So Tony Ann and I are on the faculty for both the Deming Institute and the Lean Enterprise Institute. And so we take lean and culture and process, that combination of things very seriously. And an obeya is simply a room, one location, I should say, one location where all the visualizations that your team or group of people need to get their work done is available. And I, I unknowingly was building these all the way back in the late 80s and early 90s. But when I finally got a word for them and started thinking about them seriously, one quick obey a success story is on the Coney Island Hospital Project in New York City. That was a project that had a definite deadline and it also had a fixed budget. And construction runs on cost overruns. There's constantly new things that need to happen and then change orders that go into that. There couldn't be any for this project. It was fixed. So the project had to run more smoothly than any project in history. And so in the trailer, we built out this large obeya. And on all of the walls, there were visualizations up there. There were visualizations for safety for the current construction process, for the timeline, for the procurement process, for when different groups of people were gonna be on site at different times, things that were on order, all of the information that you would need was in there. And what happened was the room worked so well that the trades, like individual tradespeople who would never go into the general contractors because that was them, that was where, that's where those people lived. They would never go into the trailer they would come into the trailer all the time just to walk around the Obeya and see what was happening on the project. So it worked so well. They'd be in there having meetings because it was in a meeting room and there would be like all these trades people waiting outside for the meeting to end. <laughs> so they built a second one on the site, actually in the building. They built a temporary room, built a kitchen in there and some stuff. 
And remember I talked about Turner's right environment. They were extending yeah. the right environment out into the field. Now all the tradespeople were informed about what was going on, who was going to be where and when. The tradespeople foremans learned that was actually important to them, which was a big shock to the foremans and to the supers. And the project finished on time. The project finished with less of a punch list than normal because everybody was focused on what was going on. And the type of visualizations that can go in there are as varied as you can come up with because we've done them in every vertical you can think of. But they're so important because right now, people on your team, regardless of what you do, whether you're a leader or anything else, your people spend most of their time searching for information or asking questions. That room kills both of those things. I'm just curious about rhythm as well, like in the collaboration equation book, I'm curious if you go into, is there some kind of rhythm? Are there rituals that you go through in the Obey room? Do you have dailies and stuff like that? Or is it a little bit more event-driven? Do you know what I mean? Is there a pattern that you've noticed? So there's column A and column B. So the team itself has a huddle every day. That huddle yeah. is in their main room and they have a huge team Kanban up on the wall there that talks about meetings when people are going to be offline, et cetera. The purpose yeah. of that Kanban is mostly discussing demands that are coming up over the upcoming week and availability of the professionals in the room. Yeah. So that no one is ever caught off guard and everybody knows when they shouldn't schedule time with other people. In the Obeya itself, every day there is a safety briefing that happens during the huddle. So the, the safety thing literally sat right next to the door and the safety officer for the project would basically back into the room and then talk back out to the other room about what was on the board, but everybody could see it when they went into the room. But there was this other board that I call it an evolving commitment board. And oh. that board had big pictures, 11 by 17 color pictures of things that were going on right now on the site. So mm -hmm. it could be placement of footings, it could be walls, it could be HVAC, whatever was going on. And that was basically the grail for what was happening right now. You could go in, you could see quality issues that were happening or things that were evolving or changes in the design or who was on site or whatever. And that was an evolving commitment board because initially that was probably going to be owned by the structural steel and concrete superintendents, but then it would be moving to the drywall, the HVAC, et cetera, superintendents. So there's like this handoff of the board of the visualization and projects that start off with a lot of defects tend to continue to get a lot more defects. So you might think that it might be that super's fault, but it actually when a project starts with a lot of defects, it becomes the culture of the project to just allow defects, broken window syndrome. So what would happen with this board is everyone would pay attention to it so they could see the kind of defects out there. And they kept thinking yeah. in their minds, now those right next to each other, how do I create a safe environment that also has low defects? And so every day, the supers that were doing the current work would have a, a briefing with the people in the field that they were working with. And in general, maybe six or seven people from the team would just show up and watch. And everybody knew as a professional, you needed to keep up on it. So they would show up maybe once a week. So in that way, they self-organized. But for every visualization that was in there, there needed to be some action around the visualization. So it didn't need to include everybody. So you didn't have to bring everybody in for a huddle and run around 15 different visualizations because people's eyeballs would bleed by that point. But you also knew that part of you being part of that right environment was knowing what was in the room. So if people had a few minutes or there was a meeting in the room, they would go look at some of the visualizations that they hadn't looked at for a while. I had to experience uh, working with an oil company where there were some gentlemen who uh, really championed the idea of obey rooms. They they called them war rooms, but I, basically what you're talking about, that was the original name, as you rightly say. And uh, they even came up with their own symbols as well, how you could tell what you needed to focus on. And I've heard of other people as well, like Klaus Leopold, like, kind of little tricks like turning cards sideways. These are the ones we're going to talk about today, kind of thing. Yep. Things yep. like that are a symbol on it, because you can't talk about everything every day, right? This is why the 
physical Kanbans beat every online Kanban that's available is localized tricks with visualizations to tell you, give you a trigger for action. So you turn that card sideways or into a diamond, you yeah. need to talk about it. You put a little yeah. red sticky on it, you need to talk about it. Online yeah. Kanbans do not allow that in any way, shape or form. At the beginning of COVID, we were doing all of our stuff in Miro, which yeah. allowed us to do that. Worked yeah. okay, too messy, too easy to make a mess in Miro. So yeah. we switched over to Iobea, which is a French product. And that has allowed the organization that we look for, but also the flexibility and visualization. It is a really nice product. Check it out. There's a tool I use as well. It's called Kanbanize. One of the strengths of electronic tools is if there's something happening at a team level, getting the automatic update to the co collaboration level, the coordination level, getting an automatic update to the percentage mm -hmm. complete up, up, you know. But yeah, I agree. It is nothing like, even last week when I was teaching, it was like just putting the marker on the board. It was just a beautiful sound. Yep. Yeah. It's funny because now like with our German clients, they're not a German company anymore. They're now a global company. During COVID, they've hired from all around the world. They can't go back. From our Milwaukee company, they're all in Milwaukee, but they don't want to go back. So <laughs> they're trying to figure out what does return for work mean for us? So they're doing what other companies are doing right now, which three days a week in the office or two days a week in the yeah. office, yeah. which yeah. is worse than not going to the office at all. Yeah. You don't see each other because you're on this different day to me, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Or, you, or worse yet, the team needs to meet. Three of them are there. Four of them aren't. You end up with three looking at one screen and four people looking at their own screens. And everybody's like, why did I come to the office for this? So what we've been working exactly. on with them is how do you choose your work now? Say you, you and go in Monday and Tuesday of next week. How do you make sure that on Monday and Tuesday, you make the most collaborative use of that time together? What can you figure out to work on that you either need to pair on, that you need to ideate on, whatever it is. Exactly. But yeah, yeah. You, when you get together and you can hold that whiteboard pen, you better yeah. either be holding coffee or a whiteboard pen. <laughs> yeah, yeah the whole time <laughs> yeah a mistake i've made in the past as well is when I, i've been traveling since july and uh, i made a mistake of arranging meetings during the days when i visited on site i mean i still discovered lots of things like even in the the few hours i was available during the day not the full eight hours but yeah it was a mistake and i should have been just planning for just being collaboration time finding out as much as possible also even getting to know people better as well and just leaving that at home time for, you know, getting stuff done, basically, uh, having that, those kind of little hibernation windows to get stuff done. And that's another coping strategy I've used as well this year, not just limiting work in progress, but carving up my week as well. And these days I work for that client and other days I work for that other client. And, and, mm -hmm. and whereas last year I was trying to do everything for everybody and trying to keep everybody happy and then keeping nobody happy. So Jim, <laughs> your company is called, well, the website is Modus Institute. Mm -hmm. And uh, I noticed in your T-shirt, it's modus uh, cooperandi, which is a really nice slogan there. And your book is Collaboration Equation. And I'm guessing it's a lot to do with obeys, a lot to do with helping leaders to feel that they're more confident about what the work getting done yep. and setting that right culture. And I loved as well, that when you talked about the obeys, it wasn't just about the delivery, which is a mistake a lot of people make. You talked about lots of other things like, triggers for action direction culture professionalism i think that's where you were talking about earlier the system of humane management i feel like the yep. system of humane management has come right through there in what yeah. you're talking yeah. about and it seems to me that lots of organizations could do with this and that this is a very timely book i would say um, I, because... i'm hoping so the thing you mentioned earlier about people saying i feel like this is a a panopticon and now my bosses can watch me is it's because the visualizations that you're building are fundamentally not giving them information that they need, but they're providing information that they feel other people need from them. Yeah, so they yeah. feel like it's a one-way transaction. It's not helping. Them. And that may yeah. not be true. It probably isn't true, but they need to develop their own visualizations and say, okay, what yeah, is yeah. missing here? What do you need to know? What is it that you're constantly asking your colleagues for? What information is constantly lost? And then we'll make sure that those things are either visualized or that you come up with some strategy to be able to, to get yeah. that more easily. That's a very good point. I made a mistake even as recently as a few years ago, Jim, 
And I often see this on LinkedIn. You got these beautiful boards and lovely lines and all oh, the stickers are perfect. I had a board like that. I was like, but the team hated it. Like, it doesn't matter yeah. how beautiful it is, how wonderful it is. If, it, if they don't like it, they won't use it. And that's it. Yeah, the I'm most sure. beautiful board looks like a freaking mess. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, be, because it's the one where you know that people are, are really living in it uh, yeah. and it's getting a lot of use. We, we were working with a team once and they had that everything, there was painter's tape for all the columns and there was yeah. this thing where it was the value stream and there was tons of tickets and then two columns with nothing in it and then tons of tickets again. Yeah. And so I was like, this is really great, but what's up with these two columns? And those two columns were ready for test and testing. And they yeah. said, well, the last time you were here, you told us that testing at the end of a process was stupid <laughs> and that we should probably test before we finish the work. So we've now started pairing with our testers. And I said, well, that's great. I said, have things been better? Oh, things have been a lot better. Why are the columns there? I said, too hard to move the tape. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so once we start to fix process, yeah. it's really hard to stop, even if you're not doing it. Yeah. And if you do have electronic tools, you have to be really careful as well that you give the teams the flexibility to change the board. Like, even if you give mm -hmm. them the flexibility, I notice they're slow to change them. But if you have the Kanban gods deciding what your boards are going to be like, you're, you're in big trouble, I think. Oh, very much. And one of the other things that worries me is it, so we focus a lot on the metrics. Yeah. You know, cycle time and throughput are important, but they are so far down the list of what most teams need that is measuring the cycle time and throughput to your broken process or your broken culture or your ability to collaborate. <laughs> and that's not helpful. And, and they end up becoming productivity metrics. I challenge anyone, figure out what your real metrics are, figure out what your root causes are to your frustrations and then fix those. And those will fix your cycle time and throughput automatically. Fix cycle time yeah. and throughput. You're going to be fixing the symptom. You're not fixing the problem. And do, do you think that work out imaging would help with that, Jim? Are you coming from a different angle? Like what kind of questions would you ask the team to figure the that out? The first thing I'd look at the value stream map and I'd see where the biggest le levels of professional frustration are. And yeah, I would listen yeah. to the stories that people are telling about like why they hate their work or who they don't like or where somebody's out to get them. And then yeah. almost immediately you can figure out that there are almost always fairly simple fixes to those intractable problems. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you just treat those problems with respect. And again, we find that if people have the right information, that the work is collaboratively created, that cycle time and throughput become the least of your concerns. And then you end up with a, like an over productivity problem where people are able to get so much work done that they go crazy. <laughs> And you're like, let's now talk about effectiveness. Let's talk about a release yeah. cycle that makes sense now. Indeed. Jim, we're almost at the end of this session, but I wanted sure. to bring up something that I saw in one of your videos and I really loved it. You basically had a few tips for how to prioritize. We mentioned earlier, but you also had one that really caught my attention, which was hate it, whatever, love it. And uh -huh. I think I could do with something like that. Because one of the things that uh, people can do if they focus and finish to a fault uh, is uh, they do the stuff they love. Uh, and there's some stuff that actually, do you know what? That's actually in the corner there. That's getting quite dangerous. Mm -hmm. Time doesn't wait for anyone. And that, that could turn into chaos at some point if you don't deal with it. And sometimes even me, I would say, especially me, that I, I, I can use limiting my work in progress to a fault to an extent that I'm not taking up the stuff that I hate, that I need to deal with, I need to get out of the way. I really love that tip. Uh, thank you for that. You bet. It's a, a, the big thing to remember about prioritization is that there's a reason why you're prioritizing and it's not to stack rank things. Yeah. <laughs> there yeah. is a context. And so if you visualize the work in the context, like client is demanding this product will blow up if we don't do this and you rank things in that two by two matrix, whatever it might be, the context will give you always a much better prioritization than stack ranking. Stack ranking is always a political act 100% of the time. Mm. And that's a hard message for me to deliver and to get through to people. Yeah, you had a very simple trick as well of like you had P1s, P2s, P3s and 
So can we even just get them into P1s, P2s, P3s? And then, okay, so now you've got three P1s. Okay, so which one we want to focus on next out of those? That was a really practical mm -hmm. tip. Yeah. Uh, really. Or are you have three things in P1, you have five things in P2, and mm -hmm. the two people that you need to work with on one of the things in P2 are available. You're going yeah. to pull that because contextually, yeah. it's now important to do that work because the resources are available. Yeah, yeah. But if yeah. I did one, two, three, and then those people were on vacation, I would be screwed. And those things happen all the time, and we call them dependencies. <laughs> <laughs> well, it was an absolute pleasure talking to you, Jim. And I want to thank you so much for this coming on the Excellent Podcast. Thank you so much. Uh -huh.